And in 81, I went to an earthquake meeting in the U.S. and I presented a, a little paper on veins around faults. And also the fact that occasionally you would find veins along the faults themselves. And sometimes they were big veins with incremental depositional textures. And there were different ways you could explain this, but one of the ways that I came up with was something in that paper I called a fault valve model. And I wasn't doing anything useful with it in terms of mineralization, and these were mostly calcite veins in Gower Peninsula, Wales, that I've been puzzling about. Incremental development of veins along a fault suggested that the faults were acting occasionally as flow conduits, intermittently. And of course it's very tempting to say, is the intermittency to do with intermittent earthquake rupture? And I suppose that's one of it's the very simple, obvious thing that you can say is that whenever a fault ruptures, its permeability probably increases by orders of magnitude. And that is really a very simple statement. But it means that sometimes faults can be essentially impermeable, but just after they've ruptured, perhaps through the aftershock period, they can become highly permeable. I was aware of that, and then I was interested in the issue of what are the stress conditions that make a fault reactivate. And there's a bit of algebra involved in that. I did the simplest two-dimensional analysis in the mid-80s, just because I didn't understand the geometry of reactivation. Uh, everyone knew that um, a fault is most favorably oriented for reactivation at about 30 degrees to the maximum compression. And I had assumed that it became progressively more unfavorably oriented as the reactivation angle either went towards zero or went towards 90. But it turns out that you get what is called frictional lockup when the angle between the fault and the maximum compressive stress is about 60 degrees. And beyond that, it's extremely difficult to make a fault move in a stress field, unless you meet a specific fluid pressure condition. So I published that as a little Journal of Structural Geology article, and it had some implications for the likely dip ranges of both normal faults and reverse faults, and they've turned out to hold pretty well. Active earthquake producing normal faults have dip ranges from 70 or 80 degrees down to about 30 degrees, and reverse faults do the same. They range in dip from almost zero up to about 60 degrees and nothing beyond that. And again, when the dip range is approaching 60 degrees, you start seeing a lot of fluid activity around reverse faults. And I started reading some wonderful volumes that came from Canada on structural controls of vein systems. And I read about this stuff, which was then called mesozonal or mesothermal gold. And the vein systems were totally different from the epizonal, epithermal, shallow vein systems of Coromandel. For a start, many of the mines followed veins to depths approaching two kilometers or more, and the grade did not appear to change much over that depth range. And uh, most of them seemed to be on reverse faults, whereas most uh, veins of Coromandel and other epithermal areas are on uh, extensional normal faults or sometimes a bit of strike slip or both. So I began to realize that uh, mineralization seemed to reflect, seemed to require particular modes of faulting at particular depths.
ranges. 